started, I want to welcome all of you to the September program meeting of the Houston chapter of the Native Prairies Association of Texas. Uh, we have a really good program for you tonight, which we will uh, start in just a moment. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Next month, uh, our October meeting will be Erin Mills from the Houston Museum of Natural Science, who's going to present on bugs. That should be really interesting, probably not as fun as being there in person, where I'm sure she would have brought a host of creepy crawlies to share with us, or maybe better, I don't know. Uh, we are going to have a virtual form of the Prairie Stampede this year. More information on both of those programs will be uh, posted on our website, in our newsletter, and on all our social media channels, so stay tuned. Our website, in case you are not familiar with it, is HoustonPrairie.org. And I believe you can join our newsletter on that website as well uh, to keep, it, keep in touch with all of our information that's going on. Um, as a housekeeping note, our speaker has asked tonight to have hold questions till the end. So uh, at the end of his presentation, if you have a question, um, you can unmute yourself and ask the question and then remute yourself and we'll see how that goes. If it turns out that we're all talking on top of each other, we'll, we'll try the raising your hand method, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. So this topic tonight is one that is of great interest to our group. Our speaker, we are very honored to welcome Forrest Smith, who is the Dan Duncan Endowed Director of the Texas Native Seeds Program at the Caesar Kleberg Wildlife Research Institute at Texas A&M Kingsville. Um, he has worked since 2001 with the Native Plant Conservation Programs of that research institute, uh, began working with the institute as an undergraduate technician and leading the efforts of the South Texas Native Project in 2008. Those initiatives have rapidly grown to the now statewide Texas Native Seed Program, which began in 2011. Today, he oversees a staff of 12 working to develop native seed sources for use in all regions of the state. Um, native seeds, seed collection uh, is a topic of interest to almost everyone on that, this call. There are seed collectors uh, abound in, in our organization. So uh, Forrest, let me welcome you to HM Pat and uh, hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. All right, well, it's good to be here. Uh, I hate that we have to have a, a get together this way instead of face to face. I don't have to admit, I, I'm still getting used to how to make a presentation uh, to my laptop instead of real people. But uh, very glad to talk about topic tonight. Uh, I'm going to share my screen to get to the PowerPoint presentation, hopefully. Okay, can everybody see the, the presentation slides? Yes. So, I guess what I'm here tonight to talk about is a book that a, a good friend of mine, Dexter Peacock, and I worked on for the last couple of years. And uh, that book is, is called A Photographic Guide to the Vegetation of the South Texas Sand Sheet. Um, it was truly a, a labor of love for me, and, and I think Dexter, the co author, also, in that we. Uh, we're both two people who, who really love the sand sheet region. And I'm gonna get into a little bit about why that is and, and why it's important, why uh, we wanted to do a book like this. Um, you know, number one, we wanted to do it to, to help people identify the plants. And my, my day job, certainly I get tons of, of emails and texted pictures and everything else from folks wanting to know, hey, what's this? this flower or this grass. And unfortunately for many, many years, there was never a book available for this region. And because of how unique it is, it really made it hard on, on recreational users of that region and ranchers and even, you know, 
hunters, weekend hobbyists to, to be able to know what plants they were seeing. And really we all, I think, appreciate that, that knowing something's name and, and knowing its values is one of the first steps to appreciating it. And so we, we took on this book uh, about three years ago now. Uh, and I'll, I'll jump into that a little more too. I want to start by showing a map of what the, the sand sheet of South Texas is. Um, it's a very distinct ecoregion that occurs over several counties just to the north of the Rio Grande Valley in deep South Texas. Uh, other names for it uh, historically were the Wild Horse Desert, um, the Devil's Backbone even. Uh, Zachary, Zachary Taylor famously said when he crossed this region, uh, I believe in the, the Spanish-American War, or maybe in the War of 1812, that if he had this part of Texas and, and hell, he would sell Texas and live in hell. Uh, when it gets dry here, it gets dry. Um, it's sandy soils. It's, it's pretty rough country when it's bad. In a year like this one, where there has been a lot of rain or a tropical storm or hurricane, uh, it can be one of the most lush grasslands on the continent. Um, extremely varied habitats. Um, but one of the most unique features of it is it's essentially all privately owned by large private ranches uh, who have made conservation, ranching, uh, wildlife management a major part of what they do. Um, probably as entire eco regions go in Texas, it's likely the most intact um, from a percentage standpoint. Basically all of of Kennedy County, which is you know, a big portion of the region, uh, is completely uninhabited. Uh, I think there's something less than 50 permanent residents in Kennedy County. Uh, so it's all ranch land and it's, it's largely unmolested and untouched, uh, which makes it really unique and special. Kind of iconic um, type of image of what the sand sheet is. It's a, an Aeolian sand plain. Uh, covered in mid and, and tall grass prairies uh, historically. <laughs> it certainly had some brush encroachment uh, overall, but many of the grasslands remain relatively intact, uh, brush free, both because fire is still big, a big part of, of the ecology of that landscape and because of, of the management effort of many of the ranches that are managing for, for livestock and wildlife. But a lot of it looks just like this picture. It's, it's relatively open, uh, kind of defined by scattered mots of brush, where you, you generally have one large mesquite tree and then an assemblage of other um, woody plants around those other brush plants. Um, and then another charismatic feature is the, the large live oak mots in the, the eastern side of the sand sheet. There's microhabitats within it that are they're also a lot different. Um, tighter soils near the drainages and near the coast can have a, a really unique brush community uh, with very different plants that occur kind of over the, the, the broad area. But it's, it's very much a, a region that's driven by the weather and the climate uh, as a sand sheet geologically is, is basically a wind deposited uh, feature. And so it's, it's constantly moving, it's constantly evolving. There's active sand dunes. And, and again, depending on weather, it can, can be one of the harshest landscapes you've ever seen or one of the most lush when it, when it is green. I think what, what really made me appreciate that region very early on, uh, so I grew up in the hill country, um, went to South Texas, to Texas A&M Kingsville as an undergraduate student. And pretty soon after that, got the opportunity to start doing a lot of work through my, my education in range management and wildlife biology in the Sanchee. And you know, if you ever, if 
you know plants, you know grasses, you know things like big blue stem, for example, that many of you know. Um, it's not a real common plant over most of the state. It's, it's gone because it won't take human activities very well. It won't take over grazing. But when you go to the sand sheet in the right year, you can see things like that are in this picture where you've got literally eight and 10 foot tall stands of a big blue stem over very expansive areas. Uh, probably a landscape that's changed almost none since uh, European settlement. And that, that's a real unique thing. That's special, uh, something that you, you really come to appreciate particularly as you travel throughout the state and see the degree of, of urbanization and habitat loss that is occurring everywhere else. Uh, you know, the sand sheet is to me where I, I got to cut my teeth on, on playing with grass seeds and learning about plants. And uh, this is a photo from back in my college days where it was looking a little rough and we were collecting seed and a bunch of it obviously had caught in my beard throughout the day and uh, you know just the place where you where you kind of learn the uh, the foundations of what your career becomes is always going to be a special place so I always say from a nostalgic sense the sand sheet was always my you know, my Everglades or my Yellowstone it's it's a very special place and and one that I've, I've wanted to impact the conservation of throughout my career. It, it's really special from a wildlife standpoint too. Um, there's some very unique wildlife that, that utilize that landscape, um, oftentimes that people aren't all that aware of. Um, this is the Texas tortoise, which is a, a state threatened reptile that, that's abundant in parts of the sand sheet. Uh, just a unique animal, very long lived, uh, kind of a miniature version of the, the giant tortoises that, that people know from elsewhere. Other things like badgers are, are relatively common in that landscape, uh, rarely seen, but they're frequent. Uh, it's it's a, a place where you can see neat ecological dynamics like badgers and, and coyotes that have symbiotic relationships and hunt together. Um, again, something you don't see when land is very fragmented and, and the habitats change. Another definite reason that it's a, a special area to many people in natural resources and in, in kind of our Texas culture is, is the sand sheet is basically the birthplace of American ranching. Um, the earliest and and certainly still to this day, largest uh, private ranching operations are in the sand sheet. Um, and of course, everyone knows the, the King Ranch, with the Kennedy Foundation, Kennedy Ranch, uh, the East Ranches, Armstrong Ranch, Uturia Ranch, um, and all of those I've named off, you know, are, are measured in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of acre um, scales. So it's, it's unique from that standpoint, certainly. Probably the, the biggest economic driver in that landscape and the biggest uh, reason people that, that don't live there or ranch there visit is that uh, six ounce bird down there on the left. Sand Sheets widely acknowledged as the, the premier hunting destination for bobwhite quail uh, in the world. Uh, that's the reason people buy ranches there. Um, that's the, one of the main reasons, frankly, people buy this book is they want to learn how to, to manage plants and habitat to benefit quail. And because of that, it, it's a unique place to teach about conservation. Um, we sometimes say that, that during quail hunting season, we, the airports and in Kingsville and Valfurious have more private jets than, than most cities. Uh, a lot of the, the world's elite from a standpoint of politics and business and decision makers come there to recreate and quail hunt. And, and so it's a, it's a great place to, if you can teach 
appreciation through of, of habitats and conservation through hunting, that's a message that, that goes far beyond uh, just that region. But quail are a big deal in the sand sheet, uh, and hopefully they'll, they'll always will be. So this book kind of came about in many ways by accident. Uh, Dexter and I uh, are, couldn't be probably more different in backgrounds and, and certainly in age either. He's uh, many, many years my senior. He had a career in law, uh, was very successful, and, and years ago purchased a ranch in the Sand Sheep to, to ranch and hunt and, and recreate once he had retired. And he got very interested in, in plants on the ranch. and had always been an avid photographer and uh, kind of through the friendship we had we had developed through our research programs um, he had me out to look at, at a bunch of photographs he had taken and uh, I was really frustrated that that the available plan ID books that were out there weren't allowing him to get done what he wanted to do which was to identify the plants and, and learn about them and over the course of of trial and error doing that for a few times. One day he finally said, you know, you you know these plants and I I like to take pictures and so do you. What what's keeping us from doing this? And uh, honestly what what was keeping anybody from it was was somebody having the dedicated time to do it. And, and as a, a great writer himself and and a photographer, having him uh, in his capacity basically Essentially, giving his time to this effort uh, is what made it happen. I, I was good to, to come in on the back end and make sure we what we said something was, it was, and, and uh, lend my science background. Uh, but he was a, a major driver of the book. I'm going to start as we go through this. I know we have lots of plant people on here pointing out some of these, these species that are in the photos. Uh, this one is, is Buckley yucca, and it's very precariously hanging on to the, the very top of a sand dune. That's a, in certain parts of the sand sheet, that's a, a typical scene. So we, we set out, decided we were going to do this book, pitched it to a and Press. They, uh, they bought off on it, and then we, we started spending a lot of time in the field with the camera and the notebook. Um, trying to to figure out what what plants to include. There's there's many many hundreds of species in this region, and it's impractical to include them all. But we wanted to include the things that when you know when somebody was in a, a truck bouncing through a pasture or, or quail hunting that stuck out to them and that they saw. And then we also wanted to include the plants of, of importance. Beyond that, we wanted to put everything important in one book. We didn't want people to have to have a, a tree book, a shrub book, a wildflower book, and a grass book. Uh, so we, we condensed it to trying to include cacti, woody plants, grasses, uh, forbs, wildflowers, everything in one, one succinct work if we could. One of the unique things about the stand sheet, and, and this is hard to see in this picture, um, Let's see if I can get my, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but in that picture there's at least five plants that grow in that few county area of the sand sheet and grow nowhere else in the world. Uh, there's a great many purely endemic species to the sand sheet and that's one of the reasons that it's looked at as, as such an important area for, for conservation. There's uh, adaptations and, and plants and ecological dynamics that are, that are completely unique to that region. And some of the, the endemic species in that photo, um, Texas grass is in it, uh, sand sunflower, sand palafoxia, and then a, a very unique variety of, of wild buckwheat. Uh, but that's a, another reason that makes plant ID in that region very, very challenging. Because if you, you know, if you have a, a book from the hill country, it, 
it very likely is going to have you know a lot of common species in it for most other regions even even some distance away but that isn't the case with this region uh, no other book out there has a lot of the plants that are in the book that we we put together um, a lot of varied habitats um, this is a field of the Texas paintbrush kind of on the northern end northeastern end of the sand sheet um, Again, an endemic species, not just to the sand sheet, but Texas. Uh, it's not found anywhere else. And then another uh, showy flower in that photograph, the taller purple spikes is uh, Texas toad flax, which I believe is also endemic to Texas. This is a plant also that uh, we included in the book that's it's kind of almost an iconic species of that region called sand plum. Uh, sand plum is endemic to the sand sheet. It's a low growing uh, true plum. Uh, Texas peach bush is a, another name for it that's used pretty frequently. Uh, very, very showy in the winter uh, and is only one of the only woody plants in some of the true grasslands that have been untouched in that region. But again, if you had taken a photograph of that and uh, tried to ID it online, or probably even on iNaturalist or looked in every book that you could possibly find, uh, you would more than likely strike out. And I, I came to realize that by the number of times certain plants would be sent to me by people on a weekend. Um, you know, I, I could always tell when when something unique was blooming because the picture started rolling in. So hopefully we've, we've allowed people to be able to, to have a chance at identifying some plants like that on their own. We've got a lot of other you know, common species to South Texas. I think the book has a lot of utility for, for much of the Gulf Coast and then, then also a lot of the Rio Grande Plain and adjacent areas. <coughs> Because a lot of there's a lot of overlap, things like black brush, acacia on the left, uh, tasajillo or prickly pear, or uh, turkey pear, sorry, uh, on the right. We tried to make sure those plants were in the book. Uh, tried to make sure to include the the really showy wildflowers. Uh, this is a pretty common scene in the spring in the sand sheet. Uh, blue bonnets are very common, but they're not Texas blue bonnets. They're generally the nat natural ones that occur there are sand blue bonnets, uh, which tend to be more blue and have very little white on them. Uh, Mexican prickly poppy, uh, also a very common spring species there. Uh, and then the yellow flowers you see in the picture are another uh, endemic species to Texas. Uh, Texas groundsel. So that's one that uh, can be hard to identify using a lot of the available books, but we tried to include it. Another thing we did was try to write the descriptions in the book in a way that, that would make you probably fail botany class if you ever took it and tried to, to describe something that way but that actually were useful to and, and worked for the person on the street. We wanted somebody that had no formal training in, in plants to be able to pick up the book and understand what it was we were describing or what it was that distinguished a plant from, from another. Uh, this is another endemic species to the sand sheep, uh, Parks croton, and it can be difficult based on the descriptions and a lot of available literature out there to identify that and tell it apart from maybe Texas Croton, Woolly Croton, some other Croton. But the way we, we tried to describe it was, you know, one, it's, it's the biggest, tallest species out there. Um, it, it can be six feet tall, and has very reddish stems, uh, there's almost always some leaves that are oranges uh, scattered through it. Things that 
that jump out to the casual observer. And Dexter was really good at, at being the filter for those kind of descriptions because he had no formal uh, training in plants. He, he was a lawyer, he's, he's very literal. And so he would take the descriptions I would write and say, you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. What, what does this mean? What is that word? Nobody's going to know what that is. And, and he was, was very good at, at making them uh, read in a way that, that allowed anybody to use the book. There's another species that, that you probably never see if you, unless you go to the sand sheet, uh, Lindheimer tephrosia. Uh, it's a unique and endemic in that it's found in the sand sheet. And then it's also found in the Llano Uplift region in central Texas, which is also characterized by sandier soils. Uh, but a very, very beautiful wildflower, uh, very prolific seed producer for, for wildlife. And just another neat plant that it was fun to include that you, you would have trouble identifying using other books. Here's a couple more uh, endemic species. Uh, on the left is Mexican bone bract, which is a, a very unique, uh, I think monotypic genus, meaning that in, within that genus, there, there's almost no other species, uh, certainly not in, in Texas that I know of. And then on the right uh, is a real showy uh, fall blooming forb. Uh, called sand palafoxia. And again, it's endemic. You, you won't find it anywhere else. So as I said earlier, we, we tried to include the uh, all types of plants. We tried to include you know, the, the showy flowers, the shrubs, the cacti, uh, but a big focus, and, you know, obviously close to my work, close to what that region is as a grassland was was grasses. And, you know, I think probably all of you know when you pick up most plant ID books uh, for grasses, they they leave a lot to be desired. Grasses can be extremely difficult to identify accurately, uh, particularly if you don't have experience with with a lot of the terminology and and uh, lingo that goes into <clears throat> making what species what. So we, we put a lot of effort into to trying to photograph uh, what it was about the grasses that set them apart, you know, show both the native grasses, but the exotic grasses too, uh, because those difference between those species has pretty considerable management implications. This is a, a picture, kind of a lucky thing to, to ever see. That's actually the flowers of big blue stem. And uh, that grass obviously is, is uncommon over much of the state, but it's probably uh, the most common in that sand sheet region. Uh, not that hard to find, but it, you, you rarely see it flowering unless you're out very early in the morning and, and catch it. Another very common native grass species in the, the sand sheet that's also found in the, the coastal prairies, uh, crinkle on. Uh, and it, it's one that stumps a lot of people when they, when they see it. Uh, it's very, very distinguishing features, very blue-green leaves, uh, distinct flowers and, and seed heads. But again, if you, you had a grass book from, from somewhere else, it, it probably wouldn't be in there it's just not a, a common species anywhere but the sand sheet. Two more kind of unique grasses uh, on the left is a is sand drop seed. Uh, there's a actually a probably what should be a variety but most people consider just an ecotype of sand drop seed in the sand sheet that it's completely different than most of the sand drop seed you see anywhere else. Uh, it's a almost a, a tall grass type species, grows you know, four to six feet tall in a wet year, uh, and can really throw people for a loop on, on what it is. But it, it stands out because of the, 
the way the seed stalks and they grow up and, and bend and curve the way they do. On the right is a grass called Tanglehead, which is a kind of in that region of a problematic native species, uh, one that, that under certain weather and, and management conditions can spread very aggressively, uh, and can, can almost act as a, uh, many of the exotic grasses do. But uh, you know, not a not a plant that that people know from elsewhere, but one that you know with any photograph at the right time of the year uh, is pretty easy to tell, and, and probably one of the few grasses that the the name actually makes sense. Uh, you can see the the seed heads literally tangle together uh, when they mature, and that's thought to be an adaptation to those pointed barbed seeds uh, catching on, on animals to then be transported other places. Uh, not a pleasant thing to walk through at certain times of the year. Okay, so we also uh, included the, what I refer to as, as the bad guys. Uh, a lot of the, the introduced vegetation exotic grasses that are you know, probably alongside habitat loss or fragmentation. Exotic grasses are, are certainly a major conservation concern in that region. Uh, in some regards, just like that region is the, the birthplace of ranching, it's the birthplace of, of using a lot of these forage grasses. And uh, you know, times have certainly changed when, when ranching was the dominant land use production of livestock forage uh, was key and it, it's frankly what kept most of those ranches intact and, and as large and, and great as they are today. But it's it's had unintended consequences. Certainly one of those is loss of, of native plant diversity in areas where <coughs> grasses like buffalo grass uh, predominate. And one of the, the main reasons we wanted to include those stories and, and those plants is that there's a lot of a lot of these plants still used, uh, still planted after uh, soil disturbance or, or planted unknowingly to, to provide cover for wildlife. Uh, and the, the only reason that happens for the most part is that people don't know better. Uh, they don't have a resource at hand that tells them, uh, you know, you shouldn't plant buffalo grass. It, will eliminate the other plant diversity and, and be a negative to wildlife and, and to, to conservation. So there's probably in the book uh, at least a dirty dozen of, of those introduced uh, grasses, non-native grasses, invasive grasses, whatever you want to call them. Uh, most of you probably know the, the one on the top left that's uh, ring dicanthium or, or clayberg blue stem, uh, very prolific, aggressive species that, that dominates many roadsides throughout uh, southeastern Texas today. Of course, on the uh, top right is King Ranch blue stem, a, a, in some ways similar species, one that's that's less common in the sand sheet, but it does occur there, uh, but is a, a very problematic. Uh, introduced grass throughout the, the central Great Plains. Uh, bottom left is Wilman lovegrass. Uh, center is a is Lehman lovegrass, and uh, bottom right is Guinea grass. All three of those grasses, interestingly, uh, thrive at basically the same latitude and the same kind of soils that are found in a lot of the sand sheet, but in Africa. And that's, they were, were brought to Texas for uh, erosion control, livestock forage provision, uh, or incidentally introduced in the case of, of guinea grass. But, you know, as, as problems go from a, a land manager standpoint, or from a conservation standpoint, knowing these grasses, uh, you know, knowing even a little bit about control options, 
and uh, it's very, very important. Guinea grass, for example, is in, in many cases fairly easy to control on a property that, that utilizes livestock for management because it's, it's extremely palatable and favored by cattle. Um, some of the others, like layman love grass, are, are just very, very difficult to control. Uh, but they respond more aggressively to certain management actions than others. In, in the case of, of layman love grass, it, it's very much fire stimulated. So simply knowing that can, can hopefully keep people from, from making a mistake that, that they might otherwise have made. You know, one of the the other aspects of the book that we we tried to incorporate and that it, it dovetail, dovetails with, with the work that I do uh, for the Cesar Clayburgh Institute and that our, our Texas Native Seeds program does throughout the state now is to include information about which seed sources of uh, many of these plants, if you were going to do a restoration project, uh, which ones would you want to use? So since we have developed a lot of uh, native seed selections that come from the sand sheet that are, that are widely available commercially throughout the book, many of the most common important species will also have a note uh, in the description that, that provides the name of, of the seed selection that, that someone could consider for a restoration project. And hopefully that, that's something that you know, gives gives people a little even more incentive to to go out and get it, uh, to have that information, to know know which plants to tell the, the pipeline company or, or whomever it might be that's doing a, a revegetation project uh, what to use. You know, I, I always wanted to do a a plant ID book, and uh, I really love sharing that knowledge, but I. One of my big goals in, in doing this book, and I, I think it's had a good impact at this, uh, was just drawing attention to that region. Um, you know, I showed you the, the expansive wild landscapes earlier, but you know, the, the reality also is, is this is a region that it's being heavily utilized increasingly for energy production, uh, whether that's wind energy, solar, uh, pipelines, taking, LNG to the coast. Um, it's it's kind of getting hit by death from a, a thousand cuts, and you know one of the one of the worst things for a piece of land is for no one to appreciate it. Uh, and the the sand sheet certainly is is often looked to as a, a blank spot on the map. There there's nothing there, but that's why it's special because there's nothing there on the map. So we wanted to open people's eyes to hopefully how important it was that there were conservation challenges. Uh, another of those is um, construction of new road infrastructure. The Rio Grande Valley is one of the fastest growing areas from a population sense in the, the world. And along with that comes the need for, for infrastructure. And so what is planted and, and what is impacted on, on roadsides should be part of that process. And, we hope to help with that. Um, energy transfer in the form of, of gas pipelines has, has been the, a really big recent impact in that region. Uh, this was one pipeline that was built that uh, one of the ranchers said it's, it's like a 43 mile long football field. Uh, big impact, uh, a lot of disturbance, uh, but something that that through the engagement of, of pipeline companies, ranchers, uh, restoration people, we, we were able to work with those folks on a, a really big restoration project that, that was pretty impactful. And I, I think you know, hopefully having a, a book in hand to be able to, to hand of people like that and, and say, hey, these are, these are important plants, these are what they are, we'll make future developers, future pipeline companies uh, do the same kind of thing. So, and here's just a few, few examples of, 
know, some of the restoration that, that we've been able to work on, you know, in around the sand sheet, uh, and a lot of the monarch butterfly beneficial projects, uh, that, that's becoming a, a big driver of, of restoration. In fact, was the reason behind that pipeline company wanting to, to restore native plants was to, to minimize any future restriction they might get in the event of a, a monarch butterfly listing. And a lot of a lot of people are taking what little old cropland there was in the sand sheet and, and reclaiming it by restoring native native plants. Uh, that's what the left picture is. The, the right middle is a an old oil and gas pad that, that was restored on, on King Ranch by reseeding. And then bottom right, uh, since for about 15 years now, uh, we've had the, the native seed sources we've developed have been specified for the roadside plantings in, in the sand sheet and, and many other areas uh, in South Texas and then some years later, other parts of Texas. But what is, is seeded on the highways has a big impact, not only on, on the vegetation there and adjacent to it, but also on the seed markets. So that's, that's an important cog in the wheel uh, or development of restoration infrastructure. Kind of to, to wrap, I want to I segue into a project that, that many of you probably have some interest in. Um, we started about three years ago a coastal prairies native seed project. It, it's basically a mirror image of, of our regional projects elsewhere, uh, the first being our, our South Texas natives project. But the, as many of you know, obtaining large quantities of uh, ecotypic native seeds for the coastal prairies uh, is very, very difficult, uh, if not impossible at, at any, any major scale. Uh, certainly there's been a lot of initiatives that have, have taken a crack at, at, at solving that problem. And many of them still still working at it and still going, but we've, we've had the chance to, to really try to ramp up an effort to do that, uh, in part because it's important to, to folks in Houston, folks like many of you on this, um, this presentation. So we're, we're actively working in that area. We've got uh, a substantial amount of, of research projects and plots uh, underway, uh, started evaluating you know, a lot of the most common species already. Uh, the photo in the center is a, a very large uh, research study at, at Wildlife Habitat Federation's property in Cat Spring, where we're, we're looking at and comparing and trying to identify suitable ecotypes, uh, suitable seed producing populations of of little blue stem, Indian grass, uh, not root bristle grass, and silver blue stem, which are just four of the species that, that we had the most collections of and, and could start with. But eventually, like we've done for for South Texas, we we hope to select and increase, you know, 25, 30 plant species and make them available in large supply. Hopefully for you know, for, for small projects, but, but a lot of our focus is on the big ones. Uh, we want to be able to help with the, the next 40 mile pipeline that cuts across the region. Uh, and that, that's certainly the scale of, of impacts that are going on there and, and, and elsewhere in the state. Uh, we had a call two Fridays ago for, from a pipeline company that wanted seed mix recommendations. Uh, by Monday for, I think it was 30 something miles of, of new pipeline right of way. And of course they wanted to plant immediately. And, and I wish, wish I could, uh, could have given them better answers than I, I could at the time, but hopefully four or five years from now, uh, if we, we get our work done the way we want to, we'll be able to give them a really good answer. And they'll be able to get really suitable seeds for a project like that. We also are, are heavily involved with TxDOT and, and 
working to provide some solutions that can, can help change their specifications. Um, the Coastal Prairie and East Texas region are one of the only regions left in the state where they don't have uh, much options uh, in terms of uh, things to reseed for erosion control other than uh, introduce grasses. So well, that's a, a major goal is to, to help with that and fix that. Of course, our, our longer term goals for that program, uh, for that project and our, our program in general is we, we wanna make uh, extremely large quantities of, of appropriate native seeds available. Uh, we when we say we we like to think in in the thousands of acres, uh, and that means seed production in in the hundreds. Um, we have a lot of great partnerships from seed companies, uh, a lot of great things being done, and and we're fairly confident that that the seeds coming from the program are, are appropriate for the use. They're uh, reasonably priced. Uh, consistently sourced and, and are being used annually on, on literally tens of thousands, uh, maybe hundreds of thousands in some years of acres. A big part of that being uh, the many new pipelines being built across the state. But in a, in a nutshell, you know, the, the book, the work we do, all of it is, is aimed at allowing people to you know can first of all conserve what's there you know, appreciate it uh, want to conserve it uh, but beyond that you know the the reason our wildlife institute is involved in in any of this work and why we care about plants uh, plants are the basis of habitat and with all wildlife uh, anytime you can put habitat back on the map that's a, a a plus in the equation for many, many wildlife species. So every every uh, marginal farmland that, that someone can restore their grassland, which is what's exhibited in that picture, uh, you know that that hundred eight hundred acres of grassland could support you know fifty more quail. Uh, and that's that's the equation we've got to win. Uh, we're not putting habitat back as fast as we're losing it uh, at a gross scale and. So we're, we've still got work to do. Uh, if you want to learn more about that work, uh, Texas Native Seeds Program that I direct or the Cesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute that it's a part of, um, we're easy to find on social media. Uh, Google us, we've got websites with tons of information. Uh, we joked we were, we were the last holdout uh, amongst our peers on Twitter, but when COVID hit, we we finally got a Twitter account at the institute. So that's when uh, we, everyone knew things were getting really bad when when we we hit the Twitterverse. If you want to buy the book, uh, it's almost sold out. Amazon has a handful of copies, uh, and that's that's really the last of the available supply I know of. Some of the Barnes and Noble stores uh, in Houston, as well as some of the smaller bookstores did stock it. And I haven't heard uh, current status on, on if there's, there's many available, but a, a second printing is, is underway, uh, but was delayed by COVID. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll open it up for a few questions. Uh, glad to discuss anything that anybody would like to. Forrest, thank you so much. That was great. Your book is uh, looks beautiful. I'll start with a question. Do you find that current cattle raising practices on the sand sheet are um, useful or detrimental to the native species down there? I think they're, they're today uh, extremely useful. And the reason for that is uh, nobody is is paying for ranches or, or making a living on cattle. Uh, and that, that includes the big guys like King Ranch. Uh, they, they make a lot of money on cattle, but quail make 
more money per acre mm -hmm. in the average year. So if you, you wanted to lease a pasture for for cattle, it would it would uh, bring in you know three to five bucks an acre a year over the long haul on average. Versus if you leased it to a quail hunter, uh, it might lease for sixteen to to twenty five dollars an acre. And so a vast majority of the cattle ranching that's done is is honestly done as a habitat management tool for quail and and wildlife. Uh, and certainly very few people are going to graze in a way that would be detrimental to their uh, their hunting and, and wildlife operation. So in, in you know in a, a grassland system like that one, particularly one that that's as naturally chaotic and quick to turn over, grazing at a, at a conservative amount, I think is very much a, a beneficial thing. That's great. I can see Frank, you have your hand up. You want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, I have a couple of questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. What, uh, what causes an aeolian sand sheet to form and why is it where it is? And uh, second question, you said there are different communities in different parts of the sand sheet. What's the difference? Okay, well, that, that's a good two-part question. The, the first part of that is, is basically the curve of the coast and an ancient uh, seashore that was at a different place than it is today. Uh, but for the most part, where the, the bend in the Texas coast is, is a, uh, an area that is subject to a current in the Gulf of Mexico that, that is also uh, accompanied by winds. So you have a large amount of, of sand that over eons was moved in and then continues to move across that landscape. Where uh, does it come from, the sand? From the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, okay. From the Gulf, yeah. Um, same part, the, the differences in habitats, they're, they're mostly soil driven. Uh, they're, they're somewhat driven by landscape position. Uh, elevation is, is very, a very big driver of, of plant communities in the sand sheet and that uh, there's many areas that are, that are basically sea level. Um, and then as you increase in elevation, oftentimes around uh, woody plants and brush, plant community changes pretty dramatically. You also have some, some influence of riverine systems uh, on the sand sheet. There's several predominant creeks that run through it, uh, almost Creek being one, uh, and then a lot of the vegetation you know, from, from the Rio Grande Plain uh, starts to integrate into the southern portion of that, that region. North to south, there's also some gradient in, in minimum temperatures on average. Uh, the very extreme parts of, of the sand sheet in the northern part of the valley rarely freeze. So there's some, some tropical plants you'll find there uh, versus if you go north to, to the Kingsville area, you, you freeze annually and, and those plants won't occur. Well, uh, one of your one of your slides showed lots of uh, Texas paintbrush, I believe, and you mentioned that it was uh, sort of in the northeast corner of the sand sheet. Uh huh. What would what would make that happen there? Uh, in that case, I, I believe that was a hayfield, and so the the reason that plant was that prolific in that spot was that that's an area that's hayed, and so the the other grass and, and vegetation was uh, taken off probably in the late fall of the year and then made it really friendly for that that particular spring wildflower to, to grow prolifically. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I typed it in, but I typed it in 
think correctly. Uh, one of your last slides looked like you had a field of Gulf muley planted in rows, and one of the uh, one of the sites where you're growing grasses. Are you just using a planter with small plates? Uh, how was that planted? Uh, so that was that's actually not Gulf muley. That that is Hall's panicle. Uh, okay, it's not not something you would typically notice as being that pink colored until you have a 10 acre field of it. Uh, I believe that was established by seeding. Uh, that's actually out of a commercial seed company's production area. Um, yeah, I think, you know, direct seeded, uh, planted flat, and then probably cultivated into rows afterward. But uh, okay. planted, most of, of those grasses are planted with a, you know, a, a typical range drill. Uh, in some cases, if they're planted on beds, it'll be a, an individual unit of something that, that, that's like a range drill. But, but a lot of these, these fluffy seeded grasses have to be planted with basically a picker wheel and an agitator in a box uh, to be okay. able to make them flow through a, a drill. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Susan Conady, I see you've got your hand up. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question, please? How, how are the beds prepared before you put down the native seed to make those rows? Do you, do you like the one that you showed at the Cat Springs property? So that, how, do, how do you, you do know, that, that? That kind of research evaluation setting, you know, those, those plants are established by transplanting greenhouse grown plugs uh, into just a typically prepared seed bed, uh, similar to what, what you would plant a garden into, uh, recently disturbed tilled soil, uh, just to, to limit competition. That, that setting is, is, is purely a research one. Uh, it's not, you know, not a not the same way you might do that if you were you were trying to restore something. Uh, our our goal is to evaluate the, the greatest potential of those plants. So we want to put them in a, a com competition-free environment, and then to equalize the conditions in the field amongst all the, the populations that are being uh, being looked at. Okay, so that's different than the idea that. Uh, how you would plant to collect the seed to have the most um, to get a, a big quantity of seed? Uh, very similar, but there's different, you know, different mindsets, different strategies to that. Uh, that one is used pretty frequently, but at some level of, of commercial or large scale seed production, those those plants are established by seeding, just because it some amount of production no one wants to, to put that many transplants in the ground. Okay, thank you. Um, Forrest, we have a question in the chat from Ann. She says, are you looking for more landowners to participate in the Coastal Prairie Native Sea Project? Yes, we are, and, and that's a, a timely question. Uh, as most of you know, it, it's the best time of the year to collect seed, and with the rain you guys just had, there may be some some really good seed produced with a lot of species. Uh, our project leader over there uh, in the coastal prairie region, uh, his name is Doug Jobes. If anybody wants to reach out um, to me, uh, I can get you in contact with Doug if you're if you're willing to let us collect seed. But we're we're certainly on the hunt for it. Uh, you know have I've got a lot already done of many of the, the more common species and have also um, been able to benefit from a lot of the collections that folks have made you know, in, the, in past years. But you know, if you have access to really high quality uh, native plants stands, uh, we're certainly interested. Fantastic. Anyone else have a question? Frank, go ahead. 
You're muted, Frank. We can't hear you. Well, lucky you. Um, <laughs> do the rings on what I think are called the scoots of the Texas tortoise uh, indicate, are those annual rings? Um, I've got to go way, way back to, uh, to college for that one. I'm not qualified to, to answer that. There, okay. There is, uh, there is a correlation between that and the age of them, but I, I know, I actually remember working on a project where uh, Parks and Wildlife was capturing and marking and then uh, trying over a very long time period to recapture as many individuals as they could uh, to try to be able to age them better. So that, that tells me that the, the rings is probably not a foolproof method, but it probably has some indication you know, of, of age. Okay. Um, for us, we have another question in the chat from Dixie, who's asking if you work with the Native American Seed Company in Junction. So we, we largely don't. Uh, and a lot of their, their production is, it can be a different scale. Um, they do a lot of wild harvest uh, seed collection, uh, whereas we've kind of taken a, a different route than that. Uh, so it, it's in some ways different work, but many times complementary. We're certainly the, the only game in town for a lot of plants that, that a program like ours will never make available. We'll never be able to grow them or uh, they just don't have the scale of market for a a model like ours. But we uh, we license our seed selections uh, through a bid process to, to several seed companies in Texas. Uh, to date, they they haven't participated in that that process. Um, okay, we have another question from Lan who asks, "What species are you testing or planting next for the Coastal Prairie Native Seed Project?" Uh, that that will depend on probably some some kind of final seed collection efforts in the next few uh, months. Honestly, uh, we're we're very interested in looking at, at some of the wild rise. And uh, the the last year we we started looking at purple top uh, collections from coastal prairie, and I believe rattlesnake master was the other one that was added this year. But we've got a, a target list of about, I think, 50, 50 plus species that we're, we're actively trying to collect. And so and as we, we get a representative sample of the populations, and you know, that's a different number for each species, but we try to get collections from throughout the region before we, we start evaluating them. Any final questions for our speaker from anyone? Uh, oh, Della uh, is asking if there's a similar book to yours for coastal prairie flora. Yeah, that, that's a really good question too. Um, so we, we've had, had some movement on, on actually trying to do one. Um, Dexter, the co-author of this book, uh, lives in Houston for half the year and so he's He's very interested in it. And then several of the, the benefactors of, of Wildlife Habitat Federation have approached us uh, to kind of get the ball rolling on that. And we've, we've already done some photography and, and some initial work on doing one. So uh, I, don't, I don't have a, a contract with the press yet to print it, but I, I think there'll be one pretty soon. That's great. In a few That's great. years. <laughs> uh, and one final question Anne is asking is your target list online yes uh, if you google search Texas Native Seeds Project or program um, and on the right side I believe of the home page there'll be a link to Coastal Prairie Project uh, and there should be a PDF of that, that priority species list and Doug's contact info also on the page that you'll get to. 
Forrest, thank you so much. It was a fantastic talk, as I said at the beginning, a subject really near and dear to everyone on this call's heart. And the book looks great. I hope we can all get it before it sells out or we'll wait for the second printing. <laughs> and uh, for everyone on the call, we will be posting the talk, but give us a little time. Give us a few days and then we'll have it up on our website. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you.